Okay, we are now going to get started. Um, first of all, hello and welcome. My name is Garrett Snedeker and I am the Deputy Director of the James Wilson Institute. On behalf of the James Wilson Institute and Americans United for Life, I'm pleased to welcome you to our interactive webinar, Dobbs and what it means for the pro-life movement. The mission of the James Wilson Institute is to restore to a new generation of lawyers, judges, and citizens the first principles of our law and the moral ground of our rights. The mission of Americans United for Life is to advance the human right to life and culture, law, and policy. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. First, today's webinar is being recorded. During the webinar, JWI staff will keep a queue for asking questions. Please utilize the Q&A feature on Zoom by hovering your cursor above the middle of the screen on Zoom and clicking on the icon that says Q ampersand A. You're encouraged to submit questions throughout the program via Q&A. The staff will alert you of your place in the queue by Zoom chat and prompt you when you're next to ask your question and then unmute your microphone. Your video will not appear, but your audio will be live when asking a question. If, however, you would prefer to ask your question anonymously or have the staff read your question on your behalf, we would be happy to do so. You may use the chat feature on the right of your screen to interact with your fellow attendees and the staff during the webinar as well. For technical questions and concerns, please send private messages on Zoom uh, to Daniel Osborne, our programs manager, or via email to staff at jwinst.org. In the interest of having as much time to hear from our speakers, I'll introduce them, but I'll keep their distinguished biographies brief. First, Hadley Arcus. Hadley Arcus is the founder of the James Wilson Institute and Professor Emeritus at Amherst College. Professor Arcus played a major role in the passing of the Born Alive Infants Protection Act. He's written many books on politics, political philosophy, and jurisprudence, most recently, Constitutional Illusions and Anchoring Truths, The Touchstone of the Natural Law, and his forthcoming book, Mere Natural Law. His articles have appeared in many professional journals. And uh, as a side note, um, he's also on the board of Americans United for Life. So this is a bit of a, a family reunion. Catherine Glenn Foster. Uh, Catherine is the president and CEO of Americans United for Life and also a 2016 fellow of our James Wilson Fellowship. She earned her JD at Georgetown University Law Center. She's a former litigation counsel for the uh, Alliance Defending Freedom, where she worked on their life litigation team, focusing on protecting the sanctity of life. Uh, Catherine's testified before and advised the Senate Judiciary Committee and other federal and state bodies. She and her work have appeared extensively in national media, and she's received many awards, including one for an article on human rights relating to embryo adoption. Finally, Josh Craddock. Josh is an affiliated scholar with the James Wilson Institute and also a 2019 fellow. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School. He clerked for the Honorable Chief Judge Timothy M. Tinkovich of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. And Josh's extensive writing has appeared in the Washington Post, Newsweek, National Review, First Things, Public Discourse, The Stream, Province Magazine. And I'll, I'd be remiss if I didn't plug also one of the most influential um, Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy articles that's been written in recent years uh, by Josh on the history of abortion restrictions um, uh, before, during, and after the passage of the 14th Amendment, extremely uh, influential in shaping the public discourse um, over um, what a post-Dobbs um, um, jurisprudence will resemble. So with that, we'll hear from each of our speakers for between 10 and 15 minutes, then we'll have some discussion uh, amongst the speakers, and then we'll open it up to the uh, to the audience. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Professor Arcus. Um, Sorry, Garrett, my apologies. We're seeming to have some internet difficulties getting Professor Arcus connected. If we could uh, go oh, ahead darn. and we'll, we'll oh, get him reconnected. Yeah, that's too bad. All right, why don't we why don't we um, start then with Catherine, um, if that's all right, and we'll we'll we'll, we'll bring uh, Hadley on as soon as he's he's back uh, uh, after you. So, Catherine, please get us started. Fantastic. Um, you know, I, I've been just thinking um, over the last week or so, a couple of weeks, about how we got here, how we got to the end of row, and I've been thinking about how momentous this moment is. 
um, you know, looking, looking at our lives, there are just a few rare occasions um, in any given life when the American story truly changes. Um, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, um, the September 11th, 2001 attacks, and the two-year COVID pandemic um, are a couple of examples of that. But on June 24th, 2022, we lived through another one of those moments when the United States Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade after nearly 50 years of shoring up this regime of constitutionalized abortion, the unspeakably tragic loss of over 60 million human lives. Justice Samuel Alito ruled that Roe must be overruled. He went on, the Constitution makes no reference to abortion and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision. Abortion, the court declared, is critically different from any other right that this court has held to fall within the 14th Amendment's protection of liberty because it destroys what Roe and Casey call fetal life and what the law now before us describes as an unborn human being. Now, I'm sure you'll always remember exactly where you were when you heard the news that the court had submitted its resignation as the National Abortion Control Board and returned the right to value and protect life back to the, back to the American people, back to the citizens of our nation, where it always belonged. I was in my kitchen making breakfast for my three kids and planning a busy day at the office um, that Friday morning. But when I saw the court's announcement, it, just in an instant, uh, my memory flashed back to the child that I lost to abortion many years ago and to the lies that the abortion business used to persuade me to make that awful decision. And then I just said a prayer of deep gratitude for my tireless co-laborers for life on the staff of Americans United for Life, um, my colleagues at James Wilson Institute, and the untold numbers of deeply devoted lawmakers and policy advocates and supporters who for 50 years have refused to accept the verdict of a small number of black robed men that women must have a right to destroy their children in the womb in order to achieve equality. Um, that's what Planned Parenthood v. Casey told us. And it's hard for me to think of a less woman forward idea than that. Um, but now we have millions of Americans asking incredulously, what just happened? <laughs> Uh, but the downfall of Roe didn't just happen. Many years ago, the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia lamented that the edifice of abortion that the court had erected seemingly overnight uh, may have to be torn down door jam by door jam and never fully toppled over. The pro-life movement took his words as a moral challenge, and we won hard-fought battles in the court that reduced Roe over decades to the Potemkin facade that the court finally pushed over this June, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, the abortion right that was proclaimed fundamental in Roe narrowly escaped being overruled nearly 20 years later, you know, 19 years later in Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Um, back then, it emerged as a mere liberty interest subject to the state's authority to regulate it, like any other medical procedure. Um, and that was not surprising in and of itself, because this, the, the Supreme Court has heard a case on abortion and on abortion law directly, not something ancillary to the process, um, free speech, for example, relating to pregnancy centers, but a, a core abortion case on average every two, two and a half years or so. And so the court has, has revisited this issue over and over. And likewise, over and over, we have seen legal scholars, both pro-life and pro-choice telling us that um, almost across the board saying that not only was Roe v. Wade wrongly decided, not only was Roe v. Wade not firmly grounded in our nation's constitution, but neither was Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Um, and so we kept fighting. And along the way, the movement secured victory after victory in the Supreme Court for the lives of women and children, ensuring that states could outlaw unlicensed back alley abortionists, uh, refrain from paying for elective abortions with taxpayer dollars, uh, insist on the reporting of abortion data that documents just how risky the procedure is no matter where it's performed, and also mandate that abortion doctors provide basic informed consent to their patients on what abortion really does to a vulnerable human being in utero. As Roe was being torn down, the pro-life movement was in fact rebuilding the system of strong legal protections for women facing abortion that the Supreme Court had nullified in one fell swoop. Uh, 
Now, more victories came after Casey, most notably a ringing affirmation from the court that some abortion procedures were simply too barbaric, that's the court's word, to permit. Criticism of Roe mounted from both the court's own justices and from many appeals court judges. And meanwhile, the abortion rate dropped precipitously year after year to the point where a woman today is only as likely to make that desperate choice as she was in 1972, the year before Roe v. Wade, the year before um, our nation's highest court struck down protective laws in all 50 states going beyond every single state's protections. And so here we are then, essentially back at the beginning. As it was before Roe, some states will continue regimes of abortion on demand and pretend that they're safeguarding some sacred right. Others will be enabled to implement strongly protective laws, outlawing the practice and providing help and support to mothers facing unexpected pregnancies. Where abortion activists seek to enshrine a so-called right to abortion in state law or impose it from the benches of state judges, AUL and our partners in the pro-life movement will be there to fight for life. Rose reversal is no mic trot moment. No one is talking about taking a victory lap and walking off into the sunset. After Roe, our work isn't done. We're going to keep defending life until every precious human being is welcomed in life and protected in law, as we have affirmed for so many years. At Americans United for Life, we are advancing the human right to life in culture, law, and policy. And we've experienced this unforgettable historic moment because of the result of the decades long work of many thousands of heroic Americans in all three realms. Culture, which both shapes and is shaped by the law, it's been moving toward rejecting abortion and embracing life for decades now. The law of abortion has at last belatedly caught up with the will of the American people in the Dobbs decision. And policy is simply the will of the people expressed through the state and federal lawmakers that they elect. And policy has led the way in building a culture of life with hundreds of pro-life bills passed in just the last 10 years, most of which we actually helped draft and, and, and helped to enact. Um, but after Roe, saving every innocent life and protecting all women from predatory abortion businesses, it has suddenly moved into the realm of the possible. Just consider this. After Roe, states have the constitutional authority to outlaw abortion at any stage of human life, including for the youngest and most vulnerable. No longer will lawmakers be able to, to duck and cover on the abortion question, claiming that they're personally opposed to abortion, but that their hands are tied because of Roe. Every federal and state legislator will be directly accountable to the people who elected them for the decisions that they make or not to protect life. And that will be a very good thing for the American body politic. In the wake of Roe, a thousand flowers will bloom to protect life. Mothers will receive care from a constellation of pro-life pregnancy centers, which currently outnumber abortion centers five to one. States will ensure that alternatives to abortion are well-funded and promoted. And infants will be welcomed and cherished in life as they should be. In fact, we at Americans United for Life, we just published a resource for states called the Battle Plan for Life, AUL's vision for the pro-life movement post-Roe. And in that resource, we look ahead to those visionary state policy solutions that will embrace that pro-life future by protecting all of our citizens, including the very youngest and the mothers who bear them. Consider also that after Roe, not only is there no longer any federal constitutional right to elective abortion, there is no federal interest in elective abortion. We've seen a slew of statutes passed by Congress since Roe that have prohibited taxpayer funding for elective abortion, prevented federal facilities from being used for abortions, and stopped federal taxpayer dollars from promoting abortion at home and abroad. And in fact, despite the protestations of the current presidential administration, after Roe, the policy of the United States expressed both in our laws and in our administrative regulations, it's to protect life and to discourage abortion. We have a pro-life policy. Neither the constitution nor federal statutes and regulations provide for a policy of protecting, funding, or supporting abortion. And that opens up a whole host of opportunities for, for protecting life at the federal level. 
So when we look ahead to the pro-life movement's ultimate goal, it is the abolition of abortion. We cannot accept halfway measures. And so while we, um, we proclaim this, this victory in battle of the issue of abortion being returned to the states, back to our elected representatives, we cannot accept these halfway measures on a nation um, or a nation divided against itself over the right to destroy our own children. Uh, abortion is incompatible with constitutional justice. And so we're gonna to continue to urge the US Supreme Court and every member of the judiciary to clarify that because abortion violates natural human rights, no authentic constitutional order can persist alongside abortion violence. We're going to continue to encourage every member of the judiciary to embrace the constitutional logic I outlined alongside my co-panelist Josh Craddock and Chad Pecknold um, in the Lincoln proposal, namely that unborn children truly are as a matter of constitutional justice entitled to the same equal protection of the laws. And at the same time, Americans United for Life also believes that America must ultimately pass a 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, clarifying for all time that abortion shall not exist within the United States of America. Finally, we will need to think differently now about what it means to have a culture of life. As critically important as strong pro-life laws are, more is needed. And so for this reason, in addition to what we at Americans United for Life do with our annual life list that surveys and, and ranks the states based on how pro-life their laws are, we are also launching a new tool to gauge just how pro-life a state's culture is, how strongly its citizens are determined to provide the means and the tools to equip women to succeed and embrace the lives they bear. And so our state reports survey a broad array of telling facts about each state's culture of life, ranging from the number of pro-life pregnancy centers it has, um, how support for such centers is reflected in state funding choices, how well the state integrates women into its workforce, what the birth rate is, and factors along those lines. But after Roe, we are ready to lead that public dialogue in the pro-life movement about what it means to be wholeheartedly pro-life supporting and protecting all members of the human family. As we have since our founding, Americans United for Life continues to strive for the day when all are welcomed throughout life and protected in law. Uh, we advocated for the human right to life in every U.S. Supreme Court case concerning abortion from Roe v. Wade in 1973 through Dobbs. And with the overturning of Roe, we will continue to advocate at both the federal and state levels and across every branch of our government for a truly comprehensive and holistic upholding of the human right to life for every mother and father, for every preborn child, and for every American in every community across this nation so that ours may truly be a, full, a future full of hope. Thank you, Catherine. That was wonderful. We're gonna to try to bring in uh, Professor Arcus over uh, telephone, so uh, we can get him connected right now. All right. Here we are. All right, we're having some, some more technical difficulties. We, we assure you we'll, we'll do everything we can to bring you Professor Arcus. In the meantime, we're gonna uh, turn to Josh Craddock. Uh, Josh, take it away. Well, this is perfect. You've, you've saved the best for last, Garrett, by, by putting Professor Arcus at the end. Um, well, at long last, Roe v. Wade's 50-year reign of terror has ended. And as Catherine just explained a moment ago, Dobbs is the most important Supreme Court decision of our lifetimes for its correction of an egregious constitutional error, yes, but much more importantly for the countless human lives that may now be rescued from the butcher's knife. 
But Dobbs doesn't end the struggle towards securing legal protection for the unborn, right? This puts us back at the starting line. And this is because Dobbs only corrects one of Roe's constitutional errors. As you might recall, to reach its well-known conclusion that the Constitution guarantees a right to abortion, the Roe court first determined that unborn children are not persons entitled to equal protection. If unborn children were persons, Roe said, the case for abortion collapses for the fetus's right to life would then be guaranteed specifically by the 14th Amendment. So after Dobbs, our task must be to secure exactly what the Roe court acknowledged, that the Constitution's guarantee that every person in the United States shall enjoy the equal protection of the laws, whether born or unborn. Now Dobbs, of course, did not decide whether preborn children are persons under the 14th Amendment. No party raised that argument, and the court didn't need to address it to decide that there's no constitutional right to an abortion. Indeed, for all its dicta about returning the question of abortion to the states, the logic of Dobbs moves towards the only just solution, recognizing the constitutional personhood of unborn children at the federal level. Five times the majority opinion observed that abortion is, quote, critically different from any other right that this court has held to fall within the 14th Amendment's protection of liberty because it destroys what Roe and Casey called fetal life and what the Mississippi law describes as an unborn human being. The majority repeatedly distinguished other substantive due process cases on the grounds that, quote, abortion is a unique act because it terminates life or potential life. So central to the Dobbs holding is the unavoidable fact that abortion takes a human life. As Justinian's Digest reminds us, it's useless to know the law without knowing the persons for whose sake it was established. Positive law concerning the meaning of person should conform as closely as possible to the reality, the nature of what human beings truly are, and justice, the duties that are owed them. Happily, the 14th Amendment's guarantees of due process and equal protection do just that. The drafters of the 14th Amendment deliberately chose the most expansive language possible, right? Any person when they drafted its due process and equal protection clauses. And they rooted those guarantees in a rich legal history that recognized the child in the womb as a natural person, entitled to the fundamental rights of persons, including life and personal security. So legislation in the states is an immediate imperative, and a federal human life amendment is an important long-term goal. But these should not excuse federal inaction on abortion in any branch of our federal government. So first, the judiciary must not shirk its responsibility to ensure equal protection for the preborn in cases that will inevitably arise. Second, as Catherine alluded to a moment ago, pro-life presidents must ensure that, equal, uh, that unborn children are treated for, as constitutional persons and implement the view, that view throughout the executive branch. We wrote about this with our co-author, Dr. Pecknold, uh, in, in the Lincoln proposal, which you can find on Americans United for Life's website. Finally, Congress must act to prohibit abortion nationwide, exercising its Section 5 power to enforce the 14th Amendment's guarantees. This legislation should have three key features. First, it should recognize unborn children as constitutional persons from the moment of their biological existence, from con conception or fertilization. Second, it should strip jurisdiction. Advocates of abortion would no doubt sue to stop a statute like this from going into effect. And with enough shots on goal, they could probably find a judge somewhere to enter a nationwide injunction. So the solution to this overreach is to eliminate federal courts' power to entertain these abusive suits. Lower federal courts are created by statute and their jurisdictions can be limited by statute. As Justice Clarence Thomas explained for a plurality of the court in a 2018 case, when Congress strips federal courts of jurisdiction, it exercises a valid legislative power, no less than when it lays taxes, coins money, declares war, or invokes any other power that the Constitution grants it. That power is rooted in Article 3, Section 2, which empowers Congress to make such exceptions to courts' federal appellate jurisdiction as Congress deems fit. So again, Clarence Thomas saying, Congress does not generally violate Article 3 when it strips federal jurisdiction over a class of cases. And to the contrary, the constitutionality of jurisdiction strip stripping statutes is well established. So in my view, Congress may and should strip jurisdiction from all federal courts to hear any cause or claim, including constitutional claims that would challenge the validity of Congress's personhood recognition and prohibition against permissive state abortion laws. 
By withdrawing from federal jurisdiction cases that challenge the validity of that recognition, Congress can defend its determination against the meddling of federal judges. Finally, the third feature that I think this legislation should have is a private right of action. Sadly, pro-lifers can't rely on prosecutors or the administrative state to enforce their legislative preferences. And it's good policy to deputize the public to help ensure compliance with Congress's pro-life legislation. So to forestall non-enforcement, Congress can confer on private individuals a cause of action to sue any person under acting under federal, state, or local uh, law to, or in interstate commerce to deprive an unborn child's rights secured by the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments and the statutes enforcing those amendments. As you guys all remember, Texas led the way in empowering citizens to use private rights of action to enforce anti-abortion policy in its SB8 legislation, which prohibits abortion after the detection of an unborn child's heartbeat. But private rights of action are common and effective in other policy areas too. So many states like California allow an individual to sue to enforce laws focused on unfair competition, false advertising, privacy, civil rights, and lots of other areas. And this isn't uncommon in federal law either, which authorizes private suits to enforce environmental protection laws, credit reporting laws, and anti-trafficking laws, just to name a few. So there's nothing novel or unprecedented about using this enforcement mechanism, and nothing less could ensure that the law is vigorously enforced. Until Roe's first and foundational error is addressed directly, America's abortion culture can never be fully uprooted. So in the aftermath of Dobbs, we must press forward to total abolition. This is, as Churchill said, not the end. Not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the beginning. And that's where we find ourselves as we move forward to protect a culture of life in America. And with that, I believe we have Professor Arcus has joined us at last. So excited to see him and hear what he has to say. Oh, uh, let's make sure that he's unmuted. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. Yes. Can, can you hear me now? Oh, I, I am here. Listen, those are two stirring talks. I'm for everything they were, <laughs> they're, they're urging. And uh, Catherine and Josh have been just great, great forces in the pro-life movement. I'm, I'm grateful to share this, this platform with you here today. And I'm, I want to thank the people who've carved out the time to be with us today. I think we're all grateful that the court has now finally overruled the well. Some of us didn't think we'd ever live to see this day. And I think of those friends who are not here to see it, Michael Newman, Rachel Jefferson, Bernie Nathanson, Nino Scalia. It took 11 Republican appointees since Roe to get five conservative votes to do this. But it did take Republican appointees because no deliverance would ever come on this question from the Democrats. But some of us have a kind of lingering unease about the grounds which all this was done and the problems that it could foretell to us for the future. As we know, the conservative legal argument on abortion was that the chief offense in villainy was that abortion was nowhere mentioned in the Constitution, and therefore there's no ground on which the judges could declare a right to abortion springing from the Constitution. For conservatives, the wrong of abortion was solved once the matter was returned to the states and the political arena. But there was the radical disconnect between the pro-life movement and the conservative judges and lawyers. But people used to come into Washington every January, the coldest weather that Washington would serve up. People were carrying signs that manifested a concern for babies being dismembered or poisoned in rooms. No one was carrying the sign, decrying the court over running past its jurisdiction. The matter moved so slowly that we didn't see the moral surgery that was being performed as many of our friends talked themselves into the perspective of conservative jurisprudence, that there was no truth to be known about the child in the womb that the court could recognize. So it was even one of my, firm, my favorite justices said, oh, this whole argument depends on the question of whether the unborn is a human life. This is a, there's no way to determine this as a, as a legal matter. It's a value judgment. Well, value judgment was a term that came in with Nietzsche. It's a term that people began to use as we lost our confidence that we could speak of moral truths. Things take on a kind of goodness as we impart value to them. The question that, that hinges on how much value 
we have for treating the child in the womb as though it were you. Lincoln famously said of the, of the question of his day that the question was whether that black man is or is not a human being. If he has, is a human being, he has the same claim to be right, ruled with his own consent. And Harry Jaffa remarked that the question of whether the black man is a black man, is a man, a human being, is not a value judgment. Uh, it, it makes no sense to invite people in the separate states to ponder how much value they would attach to the lives of black people to judge when they become human. But some of us have argued it makes as little sense to return the matter to the states on the premise that we don't know when human life begins or when that offspring of the womb really becomes human. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh says that the pro-life advocates falsely argue that the fetus is human life. And he says that's not something that uh, the judges may recognize officially as a truth. If that's the case, then conservative jurisprudence on this matter has to be grounded in a radical falsehood. When Roe versus Wade was argued, the lawyers from Texas composed an elegant brief drawing on the most updated findings of embryology, woven with principle reasoning, and they drew these critical points, that that child in the womb, that offspring in the womb, has never been anything been other than human from its first moments. It received its nourishment from the mother, but has never really been a part of the body of the mother. The conservative majority in Dobbs carefully steered around the saying of those words. It was, and it was not a matter of inadvertence, and it made the most profound difference. If the court could have spoken those words, it would have sent the matter back to the states with this understanding, that we're dealing here with creatures who've never been anything less than human. And we invite you now to consider how the killing of these small beings would be reconciled with your laws on homicide. Tell us, you know, does laws have ever been indifferent to the size and weight and age of the victim? So tell us what kinds of care you would mandate for these small humans and what, what protections you would offer. But if the court had put that simple but telling premise into place, it would have established at the same time the predicate, as Josh and I have been arguing and others, would have established the predicate on which both the Congress and the federal courts could become engaged under the 14th Amendment when the protections of the law were being withdrawn from a whole class of human beings within the states. We saw this at work in the 1940s and 50s as the judges worked through the coils of federalism to explain why the federal government could intervene more directly to protect black people in the South when the protections of the law were being drawn back. And so some of us have to wonder, once we're clear that we're dealing with human life and the law in the, in the states are licensing the taking of innocent life, what is, what is the problem here? I wonder, are our friends making of themselves victims of a perplexity as having James, or victims of perplexity from which a single spark of direct perception might have spared them? 40 years ago, 1981, Steve Gailback, sprung from Harvard, was taking the lead in making the argument for protect, using the 14th Amendment to protect the child more line, to protect the child from the womb. And now Josh Craddock, sprung from Harvard, has picked up the threads and made that argument again forcefully. But we have now an iatrogenic problem, a problem created by the doctors, the doctors of law, who've been so emphatic that the moral judgment can be exercised only with the states. And so we're seeing writers in the Wall Street Journal, certain that Congress and the national government have no business touching this matter of abortion. But the hard fact is that when the Supreme Court declared a new right to abortion and swept away those laws of the states that restricted abortion, the court made abortion the business of the national government. In states like New York had been starting to uh, make liberal easements on abortion, but after 49 years of row, their people have now taught themselves into the right to abortion, virtually unconstrained. And one state, as I heard, has already taken the lead in rejecting any restraints on the killing of the child born alive who survives the abortion. But before Roe versus Wade, the federal government was helping to fund hospitals throughout the country. And the question never arose of demanding that all hospitals receiving federal funds 
pose no barriers to abortion or providing protections of conscience to doctors and nurses who don't wish to become complicit in these surgeries. Now, nothing in the Dobbs case to commands a decision one way or another. That will be an open question. The decisions will still have to be made as to whether the federal government would keep a right to abortion in the military and diplomatic outposts, the District of Columbia, or whether the national will, will government will tilt one way or another in favoring or discouraging abortion in schools or clinics, even the work or in their own medical plans. It's the sheerest folly to think that the federal government will have no need to deal with this matter of abortion after all. For on top of everything else, we'll have the problem of mifeprista and its accompanying drug, misoprostol, which give us self-administered chemical abortions. According to the Guttmacher Institute, these pills count for a rising majority of abortions carried out in this country. These pills could be ordered by mail, and Congress uh, could not bar the states from bringing, from, from bringing in, could not restrict the states from blocking this traffic coming in across state lines. But any state that bars abortions early in pregnancy would be compelled to insist that this cannot be an over-the-counter drug, this lethal pill, and they wish to compel people to offer reasons or justifications for taking this kind of pill. In the past, Congress might have blocked the sending of these things through the mails, but that's not likely to happen now. And the question may be whether Congress would be willing to sustain the laws of a state that cast up restrictions on these materials coming in from another state. We may take our cue here from the 21st Amendment, which repealed abortion, which repealed prohibition, but then went on to bar the transportation or importation of intoxicating liquors in violation of the laws that barred them within the states. You may have to go back to that. And this would have to be done even as some Republicans in Congress, tutored by conservative jurisprudence, may be disposed to say now that the federal government should wash its hands of this issue. Now, my own initial sense of things in the steps ahead now I would come back again to that Born Alive Infants Protection Act and its more recent version to restore the serious penalties that have been stripped from that original act trying to protect the child who survived the abortion. This was the most moderate pro-life bill imaginable to protect the child who survives. It seemed to me for a while that this bill now has strategic value. For the Congress, it gives us the possible way of breaking through to those Republicans who are averse to having the national government act. That will give us a toehold. It will be the first critical step in making the point that the powers of Congress under the 14th Amendment may indeed be exercised when the laws in the blue states begin to withdraw the protections from children born alive surviving the abortion. But also in the blue states, the, the Born Alive Act promises to be the most disarming, which really tests the question of how adamant people in those states really are in refusing any restraints at all on abortion. We may find that once this issue is opened up in a disarming way, the opinion in those states may not be as monolithic as we, we've supposed. The question has not been put to people in New York in a, in a, with a matter of practical, genuine, genuine practical judgment since the 1970s. We've had plenty of evidence over the years that people who call themselves pro-choice are opposed to having abortions in order to admit a, a, a young woman to in a school, or opposed to using abortions as a form of birth control. Now, but now I may see things from a slightly different angle, as Tom Shakley of AUL relays a new survey by the Harris firm at Har Harvard, showing that 49% of the South supported restrictions on abortion at six weeks into the pregnancy. And Garrett Snedeker points out that when the timing is connected to the first registered in the field heartbeat, the figure rises to 55%. But perhaps even more tellingly, the Harris poll shows that 72% of people would support restrictions on abortion at 15 weeks. Now, what's happened here? Could it be that many people heard that the bill Mississippi barred abortions after 15 weeks under the concern for fetal pain and that the 
court have come to judge that kind of restriction as reasonable and justified. In that case, perhaps there's no need to start with something as modest as the border on that, but to test things right away with that restriction on 15 weeks that the court has already pronounced to be reasonable. We might need with a 15 week rule, or we could bring it in quickly if we can pass the border line. But there's another dimension of the legislative strategy should, that should not go unnoticed. Years ago, the federal courts were enjoining the enforcement of the federal bill that barred that grizzly surgery known as partial birth abortion. Now, I was arguing at the time that the only thing being enjoined was the bill forbidding the abortion. But that's to left the Congress free to decide that it would withhold federal bodies from any hospital or clinic that housed these surgeries. Now, just about every hospital in the country receives funding from the national government. This kind of a bill itself could close down most abortions in the country. The Democrats, the defendants of abortion, cannot help but resist this. They will not control themselves with their strength on such a matter. Yet this is exactly the way in which the reach of the federal government has been expanded over the last 50 to 60 years in accord with the liberal agenda. We still don't know why or how the federal government can be in the business of building and tearing down houses in the central cities or sponsoring clinics on birth control. The matter is not tested because there's no legislation. The rules simply come along with the money. If one doesn't accept the money, the rules are not binding. In order to resist a pro-life measure of this kind, the Democrats would have to set in place the moves that would start rolling back this whole scheme of legislative by indirection, the scheme by which the federal government has extended its reach over the last 50 to 60 years. And my line at the time was, if this is really what they wish to do, why we help them? This is for us a win-win proposition. But in that day, I find at the end of this kind of thing, a turnabout that people with a Hegelian bent to take as another instance of the cunning of history. The defenders of abortion will not hesitate to challenge those laws in the pro states that bar abortions early in pregnancy or even from the beginning of the pregnancy. But the, what now, what will the conservative federal judges do when faced with this challenge? They can't fall back on their fast test viability, I think they would be drawn back rather to Justice Alito, pointing out that if we respect human life, the human life of the child after the point of viability, why not earlier as well? In other words, we are dealing with the same entity, the same small human being, powering its own growth from one stage to another. And so it makes no sense to speak of markers of 50 weeks. 12 weeks or seven weeks, because we're dealing after all with a small human being, as the lawyers from Texas said, a small human being who has never been anything less than human in its first moments and never really a part of its mother. A federal judge may now speak those words so simple and so magical that neither the dissenters in Roe versus Wade nor the members of the conservative majority in Dobbs were moved to speak. But those would be the words that would truly mark the first critical step leading out from the decision in Dobbs, and perhaps a critical step toward exorcising that mindset of abortion that has settled in among some of our people. And with that, we could say, God bless us wonderful. Well, that was that was wonderful, um, and I think we now have a, a f quite a few issues and, and discussions on the table. Um, I, for the benefit of our of our attendees, though, I, I'd like to note that the three panelists today represent three of the most notable public intellectuals pushing against the idea that Dobbs removes the federal government. Um, from action and um, for their courageousness, because this this is certainly not a, a position that's um, you know taken as the conventional wisdom post Dobbs. Um, they they absolutely deserve our our commendation. 
Um, but the greatest foe, it seems like, is you know, inertia or inaction right now, um, and resting on you know the the immense victory that that Dobbs um, you know was. So, um, to all three of our panelists, um, what do you believe it will take for federal legislators and federal judges to still see themselves as active players um, in the constitutional scheme on abortion? I can jump in on that. Um, you know, I have been meeting with some of our good federal lawmakers, and uh, for the people that I've met with, there's um, there's not a lot of concern about inertia from from what I'm hearing for them. Um, they are um, they are excited, they are motivated, they are passionate, and they are just saying, you know, what can we do, and how soon can we do it? Um, so I think. Um, I think if anything, it really just is going to require the voice of the American people. You know, the more that we can um, speak our mind and speak with one voice saying uh, we want more, we want life to be protected. You know, we know that um, that you know, 90 percent of Americans recognize, 89 percent of Americans recognize that abortion ends the life of a human being in the womb before birth. Um, and when you look at the, the percentage of Americans, you know, 75% wanting major rollbacks at least, um, we can do so much more. When we have um, the other side talking about how they want to codify Roe, they want to even expand Roe, um, and, and they're trying there, we need to be firm. We need to be firmly standing for all human life you know, welcoming all members of the human family and um, and just letting our lawmakers know that we as Americans support this, you know, across party lines, across any kind of other division they may try to throw at us. Um, Americans are, in fact, united for life, if I may coin a phrase there. Well, it's, it, it is interesting that it took only 10 years after Brown versus Board and racial segregation before we were able to pass a national bill in Congress, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that would ban racial discrimination in private businesses open to transactions. It took only 10 years for that consensus to settle in place. It's been a remarkable achievement of the pro life movement that we have not been constantly torn, torn away from. That, that uh, the opposition, the, the moral opposition to abortion has sustained itself. Um, the arguments have persisted. Now, if I understand Garrett, Garrett's question, is about, uh, it's a matter of, of really some of our people summoning the confidence to realize that if, look, if we are dealing with a human life, is it a human life? Are the protections of the law being withdrawn now in the states from a certain class of human beings? And we say, what is the unfathomable problem for you? It's just that we haven't, uh, people just haven't been thinking about that, that along those lines in many years. But Judge, you had another angle on this. I think you, I think you've encapsulated it well. I think it requires some statesmanship. And I think uh, Catherine is absolutely right that we need to continue to press our legislators and our representatives to remind them that we will not be satisfied with inaction and that they have campaigned on uh, pro-life promises for many years. Uh, and yet, you know, they've said that they've been barred from acting by Roe v. Wade and Casey versus Planned Parenthood. And so now that those are no longer obstacles, there is no more excuse and action is demanded of them. You know, there was years ago, um, the governor of Texas, George Bush, came in to visit Father Newhouse in New York, tell him he was thinking of running for president. And he said, I'm with you on abortion, but I can't lead on abortion. And I once told the audience in North Carolina, what if, what if I, what if I have, have people who look out at this landscape and they think 800,000 members of a minority group were being killed each year without the need to render justification? Where would you place that in the rankings of those issues that are more or less important? Would it be just below the level of the question of interest rates or unemployment? Or could you understand it if those of us who looked out and saw that could not regard it as a peripheral issue, 
that is something that has to be central. And so one of the presidents who they, they want to put the joke, gov the governor, later president Bush was, you think real people are getting killed in these things. What is it among some of our people that they're falling into these say, facile assumptions of the other side, it's less human when we cannot see it and so on. But just for that critical point to break through finally, people who just draw the implications of it, I think would be the, the bad events would be so decisive. You know, looking back, I, I just see so much progress over the last decades. Right. And, and even outside of the law, if we can just set that to the side for a moment, we've seen so much progress in science and in medicine um, to the point where, you know, at the time of Roe, uh, we usually were not seeing ultrasounds of that child in the womb, right? Um, but now that's just standard procedure. So, you know, anyone looking at it can see their child um, moving, uh, sucking their thumb, yawning. Uh, we see that visual image reminding us that this is a human being in the womb. Um, we also have come so far not only in public um, opinion on abortion, which is more and more pro-life, the more we talk about it, right? But also just on, just on that base issue, are we talking about it? When I, was, um, when I was 19 years old and I had my abortion, I had grown up in a pro-life family. I, uh, my best friend in, in school was pro-life, I knew that. I don't believe I had ever heard the word abortion. I did not know uh, what the term meant, didn't know what it was, how it was performed, none of it until I walked through the doors of that abortion facility and I got no further answers there. I had no idea what was going to be happening to me. Um, and so just knowing that more and more we're having that discussion, that we're educating um, the young women, um, the girls around us on just what an abortion is and why we should support life, that human rights centered discussion that has been, um, I believe, transformative in our nation. And similarly, I think that's um, that's in large part fueled some of the change that we've seen on the political level as well and in our nation's laws, because you know, more and more, it's become almost unthinkable to run um, as a Republican and not have a strong pro-life stance. You know, it's the kind of, of discussion that we expect to hear, um, hear about it in debates. We expect to hear that in the, in, the, um, in the speeches and we see it in the party platform. So the more that we discuss this issue, the more it becomes not just an abstract um, not just some esoteric area of the law, the more it becomes real for us, the more we recognize that those 800,000 are 800,000 individual human beings and every single one of those lives uh, matters and deserves to be protected. And, um, and we learn what the risks are, what the threats are, and we learn what we can do to support um, those children and the moms who are carrying them. Oh, it's, you know, it's... Catherine, you should be running for president. Now, um, the, you know, you might be, that uh, the, uh, the scenography and everything, it, it's not that they're becoming more human or they, it's our, our equipment has, has, has improved. Uh, we can hear the heartbeats earlier with Doppler, Doppler measurements, but that simply means that, that we, we've improved our amplifier signs. It doesn't mean that uh, the that heart has, has uh, begun beating early, but even so, people have to understand that the beating of the heart is simply one other sign of a life that's already there and growing and integrating its own growth. Um, it, you know, part of this is that, remember Lincoln said, see, if this issue of slavery was a central issue, but we can't talk about it in the churches, it's too explosive. We can't talk about it in politics, it's too explosive. We need some place to talk about it. And the pitch was that what a statesman does is understand the things that are really central and try to give people some way of talking about it. So that you could see, you know, as Lincoln made his speeches, those speeches were making their way into the letters of civil, of soldiers in the Civil War. And right now we're dealing with uh, a reluctance to talk about this issue. Remember that Rabbi George's old line about the first George Bush the pro his problem for the pro-lifers said he was all action and no talk. And we needed the talk to help frame the argument. Uh, Fox News doesn't like to cover abortion. 
these are some of the most conservative networks, but they don't cover it because um, they understand people have got there, but they aren't comfortable talking about this. But there must be the task of statesmen is to show, show people how it's plausible to talk about this. And uh, I'd like to turn it over. We have some very interesting questions from the audience in the queue. Uh, but but even before that, I think the statesmanship angle will be tested um, far sooner. Uh, um, just because even though uh, President Biden has said that um, you know, he wants to codify Roe um, uh, and he won't take um, executive action um, any further, there are numerous proposals. Um, uh, uh, just yesterday, um, there was a, a law review article that was quoted in uh, the online journal Slate, um, which laid out at least seven different ways that the um, Biden administration could act on uh, uh, you know, their um, uh, pro-abortion leanings. And so... Um, I think that this this is not going to be um, you know a question that uh, federal the federal Congress um, the uh, and and federal judges are going to be able to um, to duck indefinitely um, and the uh, arguments that you know Josh Catherine and Hadley you've made um, you know are, are are certainly you know relevant and um, it brings us now um, uh, to our audience question so. Um, the first question from the audience I'd like to um, address is from Aaron Hogan, and Aaron has a two-part question, one for Josh and one for Catherine. So Aaron asks, Josh, do you have any red flags when it comes to private right of action and how that could be turned over, uh, turned in over its head and used against conservatives or pro-lifers, for example, the manufacturing of AR-15s? And then for Catherine, can you remind us about the new initiative by AOL to grade states based on their pro-life stances? All right. So... Um, and I assume that's in the context of um, trying to uh, you know, shape how you know a discussion of you now the post Dobbs landscape um, uh, will be you know uh, a more robust um, you know example of federalism. So Josh first, and then Catherine. Sure. Yeah, I think this argument had more force. The idea that private rights of action might be burden used to burden uh, other constitutional rights had more force before Dobbs, in the sense that before Dobbs, abortion was recognized incorrectly as a constitutional right. I don't think that there is a similar problem today where the court has now correctly recognized that there is no constitutional right to abortion. I don't think you could see the same sort of turnabout uh, with blue states trying to burden actual rights that are in the constitution, uh, whether it's you know uh, the right to free speech or your right to bear arms, whatever it might be. I don't think that argument has force anymore. And I think that the key difference is that uh, you can't do that to burden rights that are actually in the Constitution, but abortion is not a right that's in the Constitution, and Dobbs makes that very clear. So um, at Americans United for Life, we have for almost 20 years now published Defending Life. That is our resource where we rank um, all of the states on how pro-life their laws are in our life list. We go through and give an overview, a summary of all the pro-life laws or, um, or pro-abortion laws in every state, um, all the laws relating to life generally. So really we take a look at and all the laws that, um, that support or threaten life from fertilization through natural death, um, full spectrum of life issues. So we have that. We also um, include some of our um, 60 plus model bills that we have available for state lawmakers to uh, either adapt in full or to tailor to their state um, and their particular needs. And, uh, and articles on the state of the pro-life movement in that given year, it's our annual resource. So we have that life list that's existed for, um, for many, many years. What we are adding to that is this kind of state of the states analysis where we're going into, um, into the state's policies and seeing um, you know, what choices is this state making to support life? In what ways are women, uh, girls who, um, who find themselves facing an unexpected pregnancy within that state, in what ways are they supported? You know, what more can we do um, to support um, to support these, these young women and these girls? Um, are there pregnancy centers available to them? Are those pregnancy centers um, supported by, um, by, state, uh, by state funding or by any other way that, um, that, we, can, um, that we can bolster their, um, 
their uh, their ability to equip women to to succeed and to embrace the children that they're carrying. Um, so we're looking at that as well. We're looking at um, at protections for women in the workforce and and how well women are integrated into the state workforce. You know, what percentage of women are working and what protections do they have? Um, what is the birth rate in that state? Um, and going beyond that, you know, what are um, what are the the pregnancy rates and and other telling rates, um, factors along those lines. So what we're doing is trying to see what is the state policy supporting life? You know, what kinds of, um, of life supportive um, tools and resources do this, does the state provide for women facing abortion or um, are potentially abortion vulnerable? And, um, and what's the outcome of that? So how is that how is our, our culture of life that we're trying to um, trying to build in each state? How well is it being lived out in that given state? So it's about um, it's about the public dialogue relating to abortion and um, and life issues, and it's about putting that into practice. You know, putting our money where our mouth is. Aul Aul is just remarkable. What a formidable operation. There's been. That very little like it. I've been working with AOL for 50 years, and it's just, uh, it, it sounds just so terrific. Every, we are every, grateful to have you on our board of advisors. At every level, it's been great. Yeah. But there's uh, somebody else. Uh, uh, Rich Thurflinger had a question, I think, but uh, Jer Garrett, you have all this in the queue. Garrett? Hello? Did we lose him? And uh, there he's talking. There he is. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. One of the great benefits of doing a webinar with AUL um, and uh, uh, and JWI, or the the audience is uh, is just as distinguished, <laughs> oftentimes, um, as the panelists. Um, there's a follow up question actually um, submitted in the queue from Deborah Tilden about uh, one example in Montana. The abortion lobby and Democrats are challenging every single pro life law, including chemical abortion restrictions. What's our best approach to push back on that? And I think you know maybe this this follows on, Catherine, to your discussion of you know every state's going to have a different strategy, but um, there have to be common tactics. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, every state does have a different strategy. That's part of our battle plan for life that we're that we've released to all of the states. Um, however, uh, Montana is a good example here because in Montana they passed. Um, I actually testified on this bill. Um, they passed the. Um, the chemical abortion bill that we at Americans United for Life worked with allied pro-life organizations um, such as the scholars at Charlotte Lozier Institute um, to put together and uh, and they passed it in full it includes all the protections for chemical abortion um, including informed consent including making sure that um, that the woman gets all the medical care and the follow-up that she needs you know tragically the the grim irony, I would say, of, um, of what's going on now with chemical abortion is that is the very people who are advocating most vociferously for expanded telemedicine chemical abortion. Um, and, and I will say telemedicine has its appropriate uses during COVID. I used telemedicine a couple of times. It was very helpful. Um, uh, I had some ear pain at one point, things like that. Um, mental health care, so many good uses. Uh, abortion is not one of them. Um, even for this, this time immediately post-ops, abortion is not one of them. We need those physical in-person exams. Um, we need the ultrasound. We have to make sure that the pregnancy is not ectopic, which is a life-threatening condition. Uh, we need to make sure that, um, that we know how far along that pregnancy is, because otherwise, you know, you could be talking about giving abortion drugs at a much later date when they are you know, even remotely indicated. We've seen that happen and we've seen what can happen as a result of that. And not only that, we know that chemical abortion drugs um, are in fact more dangerous um, in many ways than surgical abortions, a higher risk of hemorrhage, higher risk of sepsis. And so knowing that, it's just, it, it's tragic to me that anyone would be advocating for expanded telemed abortions when we know those risks that we are just trying to prevent when we pass protective laws to make sure that women do get uh, that in-person exam, that they do get 
um, to be able to see a doctor in person. And so that's really, I think, what we need to focus on. You know, Montana has the law in place. It's done the right thing. What now is that we have to defend it um, in court if it comes to it, but, um, but certainly in the public square, we need to be sure that people know the truth about just how dangerous chemical abortion is, um, the risks, um, the, the lives that have been tragically lost to chemical abortion, all of the, um, the physical and, um, and other sequelae that can happen after a chemical abortion um, when you know, a woman has to then go get a follow-up uh, surgery or other kind of medical care because something has gone very wrong, uh, not to mention um, all of the emotional after effects and psychological after effects, which are different in a way from a surgical abortion because, you know, it, it's, it's quote unquote self-managed, right? It's something that you're um, taking yourself and you're having to, to face the aftermath yourself. Um, so, uh, so for all those reasons, we need to be very clear about just what a chemical abortion is, just as we have increasingly been, you know, simply talking as a culture about just what abortion is. The more we talk about this issue, the more people, um, you know, come to see the, the truth and they, they, they join the side of life. Catherine, a quick follow-up question. That law in Montana, that was framed before Dobbs, I take it, right? It so, was, yes. So it was framed when people assume they had to presume a constitutional right. And all you're trying to do is put in certain cautionary things. Now, now after Dobbs, what would, what would the approach be? It'd be something like starting with the notion that this just cannot be an over-the-counter drug, something like that? Sure, you know, after Dobbs, all doors are open. Dobbs um, really removed the cap of Roe. Roe told us that states were limited in so many different ways, in, um, and Roe and its progeny, Casey, and other cases, that states could not protect human beings at, um, at most to all stages of, um, of gestational life, that, um, that states could not do anything that would unduly burden a woman's access to abortion. Right. And, um, and so the, the limitations were there. Now, without those limitations, we can dramatically expand what we can do. So while we do still have that model bill that's appropriate um, for states that, um, that are not quite as far along as, for example, um, you know, one of those states that it's at the top, of Americans United for Life's Life List. Um, but we absolutely are expanding to, um, to options where we say, no, we cannot have, uh, we will not have chemical abortion in this state, um, that there will be no abortion by any means. That's, now that's terrific. And you would, you would need some help from Congress on that, right? At a national level, absolutely. Yeah, yeah you would need help from Congress in saying, why, why, is, why am I not free to just order this thing? by mail coming in across the lines of the state. Yeah. Okay. We need some more. Yeah. Um, so we had a, a, a question um, from our former intern, Sean Tehan, that Josh was fast, fast to res uh, respond to. Um, but I want, for the benefit of all of our, our listeners, I want them to hear the question. And Josh, you, you certainly should take the first crack at it. Uh, Sean asks, on the question of fetal personhood, SCOTUS mostly answers the question, who decides? Whether we like it or not, someone or some branch of government has to decide who is included in the human family or the polity. The conservative legal movement has made its money off the idea that questions like this need to be decided by the people rather than nine judges. Why should the question of legal personhood be left to judges though? Yeah, so I, as I mentioned in the chat box and, and in my previous comments, I think that every level and branch of government has a role to play here. Uh, states should act to prohibit abortion and guarantee equal protection within their states. Uh, Section 5 of the 14th Amendment indicates that Congress was designed to be the original and primary enforcer of the 14th Amendment's guarantees. So I think you know that's the basis for federal legislation, as I outlined earlier. Uh, the executive swears an oath to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. And before you can faithfully execute those laws, you have to interpret them and understand them. And it's not just outsourcing that interpretation to the Supreme Court, but actually exercising an independent constitutional role of an interpretation. And so the executive to take care that the law 
is faithfully executed must vindicate the equal protection guarantee that I've shown applies to the unborn child. Uh, but, but the judiciary plays an important role too, and it can't shirk or punt the question of personhood, because as Marbury teaches, the court must say what the law is and apply it to the parties before it. So the court could no more ignore or defer on the question of what a person is, uh, as that is a legal question, but also more importantly, as a, as a matter of reality and fundamental metaphysics and ontology. Uh, it could no more punt on that question than it could about any other, uh, any other basic concept that we use to understand the world around us. As Professor Arcus has so artfully pointed out in many previous lectures, uh, judges often don't realize that they're doing natural law when they interpret the constitution or the statutes because it comes so naturally to them. The logic of law is the law of nature. And so I think that, um, I, think that that, I hope, answers the question. It's not just leaving the question of legal personhood to judges, uh, but judges can't evade that responsibility either. Well, it's a curious question people used to say, who would make that decision? We put it in the legislatures. That gives rise to the question, well, who is fit? Who are the kinds of creatures fitted to serve in the legislature? Are, are the dolphins voting in, in Massachusetts? Of course we understand. The whole, the whole scheme begins with the notion of the, the nature of that being from which the laws and the polis emanates in the first place. That being who can give and understand reasons over matters of right and wrong. We are dealing with a human person. So, so when you know, those, those provisions of the Fifth Amendment and everything else that mentions rights. But we assume that, that, that women are included. Of course, we assume that this, this covers all human beings. So I'm wondering why are we suddenly in a state of kind of uh, agnosticism or bewilderment? This is the question of uh, who is the kind of being who comes up within the protections of, of the law? I don't know why this, this suffers with such a, 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 a matter of bewilderment for people. But anyway, I'm sorry to go on because we have other people. Rebecca Bessel had a question I saw, and, and Rich Durfin really wanted to weigh in. So, but us do we have? There are there are there are questions flying in the chat, and we're we're doing our best to try and distill them. Um, okay. There is a there is a question that was submitted though in the Q and A that um, I, I think um, you know Catherine maybe you can help us out with from Charles McCoy. Many media outlets have already been pushing the narrative that pro life laws, even those with exceptions for the life of the mother, will jeopardize the lives of pregnant women who are facing genuine medical tragedies. A decade ago, this kind of narrative was used to great effect in Ireland to overturn their pro life laws, both in terms of media presence and legal construction. How can the pro life movement address these concerns and prevent them from turning public opinion and legal action against life? Um, yeah, you know, and I would also quickly say, um, you know, Hadley and everything you just said, you were absolutely right. Um, you know, anytime you start carving out some class of human beings to no longer be protected under our nation's laws, you are, um, you're going against natural law, the constitutional order, everything top to bottom, soup to nuts. Um, you know, when it comes to those those hard cases, um, when it comes to ectopic pregnancies, when it comes to life of the mother kinds of situations, um, what we need to do is simply be clear, those are not abortions. So in the law, what we need to do is simply define what an abortion is, you know, the intentional killing of a human being um, prior to birth. And um, an ectopic pregnancy is not that. Um, anything that takes place to save the life of a mother is not an abortion. Now, there may be situations, um, very tough situations, and we do not want to make light of them, where perhaps a child needs to be delivered early um, and, um, and may be, in fact, at an age too young to survive. That is not an abortion. That child is seen as a second patient right alongside his or her mother. And every effort is made to save that child's life. Um, not an abortion. You know, an abortion is where you would go in and intentionally kill that child before birth, even um, with the intent to, um, to end the life. And then you could treat the mother, but the child is not viewed as a patient. Um, similarly, if, um, if the mother needs some kind of treatment for, um, for, for example, cancer, um, perhaps radiation or something um, that might endanger the life of the child, that is not an abortion. That would be a tragic uh, consequence, side effect 
not an abortion, not intentionally ending the life of the child. So when we simply use the right definition, we put that in our laws, we explain what we're talking about, no medical treatment is off the table. Every legitimate medical treatment for ectopic pregnancy, um, for cancer, for any other um, kind of condition that the mother may have, all of that is on the table and nothing has been removed by Dobbs. Nothing will be removed by any state. All medications are on the table. All interventions are on the table. We in the pro-life movement care about women. If I could just jump in, I want to underscore I th everything that Catherine said is 100% correct. And I just want to mention that in international perspective, there's no inconsistency between promoting and protecting the life of the mother and also protecting the life of the unborn child. So in Ireland, prior to their recent uh, loosening of abortion laws, uh, they actually had one of the lowest maternal mortality rates in the world, even though they completely prohibited abortion. Another great example is Chile, uh, which after 1989 prohibited all abortion, and they had the second best maternal mortality rate in the Americas. So much better than the United States, second only to Canada. And actually, as time went on, there were fewer women seeking uh, abortions unlawfully as the law was in, in effect. And Malta is another great example of a place where, again, we have protection for the unborn child and extremely low rates of maternal mortality. So I think the bottom line is that there's no inconsistency between protecting women's health and protecting the unborn child. And that's exactly what Catherine said there, those situations where you have a necessary medical intervention to remove the child, it's a tragic circumstance, but it's not properly called abortion. Now we do need to keep working to improve our maternal mortality rate. We do need to work to, um, to bring equality across the board in, um, in care for all women. But, um, but as you said, abortion, as has been amply demonstrated, particularly in the international arena, abortion is not the way to get there. Terrific, perfect. Um, so, I want to, while we're on those hard edge cases, um, I do want to get to what was uh, articulated in one of the Q and A's um, as as one of the more you know, common responses to okay, if if you're going to recognize fetal personhood, how does the law then treat the um, uh, the mother of the child? Um, what, we have an anonymous question um, which says which asks one of the arguments against fetal personhood is that it brings pregnant mothers into legal jeopardy. In addition pro-life movement is very clear that these mothers are victims, not criminals, but if the unborn are 14th Amendment persons equal to any other, how is this different from infanticide, and why would pregnant women not be feloniously liable to criminal prosecution? The fear, of course, that um, what may be you know, uh, legally and, and morally coherent could politically backfire. Yeah, I, I'm sure Catherine has great thoughts to add here as well, but I'll just, just speak just briefly to this. I think that it's actually a myth from Roe. This is one of the arguments that Roe made, and I think it's a myth that there is any necessary connection between how we assign criminal penalties and the personhood of the unborn child. Because there's lots of examples in law where we might have aggravating or mitigating factors for how we charge or treat uh, certain crimes. For example, if you uh, commit homicide of a police officer, that's an aggregating factor. Does anyone believe that police officers are more human persons than other types of victims? Of course not. Uh, many times, uh, if the victim is a child, that's an aggravating factor. Or, or as another example, uh, there are some, you know, certain uh, types of homo second degree homicide uh, where it's, it's not premeditated, where we treat it lower, uh, as a lower offense. Do we think that those victims are less human persons? No, of course not. So I don't think there's any necessary connection between how we classify abortion or treat uh, certain people who commit abortion and the personhood of the unborn child. There's no necessary connection between those things. Uh, I do think that if you protect uh, the life of the unborn child, there historically were reasons why uh, many states did, chose not to charge women for procuring abortion. About one third of states did, uh, but two thirds of states did not. And the reasons for that were one, uh, primarily, there was some there was some paternalistic and infantilizing uh, rhetoric about women not being responsible for their own decisions. But secondly, and I think more importantly, there were legislative and case by case immunities conferred on women specifically for, because they would be the most likely individuals to testify against an abortionist and to bring the the, the person responsible for 
many abortions to justice. And so there was a legislative or case by case judicial immunity granted to women to encourage those women to come forward and testify against abortionists and these, uh, you know, quack doctors that were performing abortions. So that's just from historical perspective. Uh, correct. And likewise, historically, it was, in fact, the abortion, um, the abortionists themselves who were promoting hailing women into court and charging women with the crime of abortion simply because they knew that that would provide them with some level of protection or immunity. It would incentivize the woman um, and not to report that um, that crime, um, even though, as we know, then as now, um, so many abortions are due to um, pressure, uh, coercion, abuse. Um, but it was really it was the abortion facilities who were saying that we need to, that we need to be prosecuting women. Um, which again, it's it's hard to think of a of a less pro woman environment than that. They've successfully rebranded themselves in the decades uh, since, in the last fifty years in particular. But but that's the history behind it. And so we, the pro life movement do not support uh, criminalizing women um, and putting women in jail or in any other way punishing the woman. Now, I, I did write a white paper on restorative justice in the, in the context of abortion. And in that, what we talk about, um, it was a co-author with Amy Murphy um, of Rehumanize, but, um, but we talk about you know, what we can offer to all those impacted by abortion, uh, what resources, what we can do to, um, to really provide care and support um, and not just criminalization. I, know, I think what it's, it's all very, what's like way behind us all the years also, it's kind of a, a sense that the woman often is a victim that uh, she's making the decision under immense pressure, usually with a male who's not willing to stand with her. And people make a difference which are drawn to a distinction between that woman under those circumstances and the abortionist with, with cold sobriety who's willing to make his living by destroying an innocent life. And no, no doubt there's some, we've had women who, who think, who, who assert that their abortion was the one affirming, affirming experience in their life. No, they're not that done for that. But I think the disposition of the pro-life movement is to, not to be judgmental on the, on the woman who, who finds herself in this situation. Okay. So I think we have time. We have, we have time just for, I think, one more question. Um, I want to make sure we, you know, we give um, Hadley you a little time to, you know, make sure that the rationale for the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection um, Act, which, you know, you were, uh, of course, one of the, you were the architect of the original Born Alive Act, but You've also now, um, you know, advocated for adding uh, both criminal and civil penalties um, uh, to that act. Um, I want to make sure we, you know, we we, we hear uh, what you would consider to be, you know, that that modest first step. Um, but we also had a question about um, uh, how are we going to deal with, um, you know, maybe this uh, this idea of. Uh, um, in a post obs world, um, uh, children who are born with um, disabilities, um, you know, treating them with equal dignity. Um, is this something that the pro-life movement um, can now use? I know we've, we, we, we've seen for years the pro-life movement at the vanguard of um, you know, uh, advocating against the um, uh, disproportionate uh, number of abortions um, uh, performed on children with Down syndrome. Um, does, post, does, does the post Dobbs uh, environment give us a significant opportunity to reinforce um, those laws uh, in the states um, uh, and elsewhere? Um, uh, or, and or, you know, uh, uh, is this the opportunity to, you know, uh, uh, to start with, um, you know, the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act, um, you know, ways to show that, you know, we are not, you know, necessarily going to um, uh, need to, you know, recognize, um, you know, fetal personhood, um, to have a, you know, a full pro-life agenda, though. I'm not sure it gives, it gives us even, even a moment to just simply to affirm again that um, um, we're dealing with human life, you know. Remember, they, they you know, used to have the old case of baby Doe in Long Island born with spina bifida and Down syndrome. 
uh, the Reagan administration simply sought access to find out what are the grounds on which uh, medical care was being withdrawn from the child. And the stance of the administration was that if you're telling us the surgery is futile, we're not going to insist you have a, a heroic futile surgery. But if you're withdrawing the, the care on the premise that a life afflicted with Down syndrome is not a life worth living, that's not a medical judgment. That's a moral judgment. And I think we're just, I don't know, and the aftermath of this, I don't know exactly, exactly what, what if coming out of the Dobbs decision would help us sharpen that point or uh, give it more, more force. But uh, unless you say that these, these judgments long imminent in the movement and in the art, Will simply give us a chance to will give us a chance to raise them again as they will be challenged, as we know they'll be challenged. And I'm open to any other other arguments on this. But wait, did you say we're rich? You can't get rich Durflinger in. You see yet? I don't think we we had a, a question in the Q and A from him, but um, Catherine, go ahead. Um, yeah, um, I, I would just say simply put, um, carving out as I said earlier, any group of human beings for less protection as less worthy of life for whatever reason, um, it's simply wrong. We as human beings have human rights and anything that, that removes those human rights from any class of human beings is bias, it's discrimination. Um, and in this kind of case, it's eugenics. Um, it's inhumane and it is incompatible with any kind of uh, modern, ordered, constitutional uh, society. It must be rejected wholesale. Josh? Yeah, I, I agree. I don't have anything to add except that, um, you know, people with Down syndrome and, uh, you know, other, other issues like that are just the most wonderful people and it would be a tragedy. Uh, to discriminate against those individuals. And as Catherine said, singling out any, the weakest and most vulnerable among us is, is terrible, uh, but it's even worse uh, to focus on, on those you know, who we should be a have a special care and protection and duty toward. Well, um, I think with, with, with that, uh, you know, please, uh, please join me in thanking our, our wonderful panelists uh, for such an insightful and spirited discussion today. Um, JWI and, and, and AUL um, are looking ahead in the, in, in the months to come to more opportunities to you know, really um, fully develop what a post-Dobbs legal and, and policy landscape um, will resemble and we hope you will join us um, in that effort as well. Um, we'll, be, we'll be certainly um, hosting more events and um, please keep an eye out for um, for those in the in the coming months. But thank you again to everyone. A recording of this webinar will be made available shortly for you to share with all of your friends who weren't able to attend. Um, but again, thank you so much and uh, we're grateful for, uh, for you joining us today. Are they still? Are we still on with Catherine and? Uh, are we still on with Catherine and Josh?